nothing worries me because I don't care about my life too much. Right. <laughs> that sounds depressing, but it's my tool to be like, yeah. oh, I actually need to think this way in order to keep moving and do the things I want to do. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Jesse Nyberg podcast. Today we're here with Zimri, designer, uh, renovator of houses, and overall pretty cool, funny guy that I follow on YouTube. So how are you doing, man? I'm doing pretty okay. I'm very hungry, but I clean my room, so I feel amazing. Yeah, it how looks nice. I'm, I'm always trying to see your, uh, you know, I'm curious to see like how the entire house looks once you once you do that. Yeah, I just finished the last room, so it all looks pretty spicy, if I may say so myself. Yeah. What have you kind of been doing this week, just working on that stuff? Um, yeah, exclusively. Yeah. I'm trying to get, uh, it's three bedroom, so I got one room rented out, and then I just finished the third bedroom. So I'm trying to find somebody else super cool. I was wondering if you wanted to move to Texas. <laughs> Man, when I heard the price, I was like, 400 that's like hey. super cheap. <laughs> yeah, right? That's it's like how awesome. much I pay pretty much in just the stuff that's not my rent each month, like just the other bullshit you got to pay for. Absolutely. I think I watched one of your vlogs or something. You you have a partner, you all live together. Right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So then is the rent pretty okay for you guys? Yeah, it's not like for LA standards, you know, like people out here will be like, oh yeah, not bad. But like if I tell yeah. anyone anywhere else, they're like, what the fuck? Like you pay okay. that much, like a thousand or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you it's lived good. out here, right? So you know, kind of know how, uh, yeah, how that goes. Yeah, for like four or five years. Were you always, uh, like before you moved to Texas and then I think you said you moved like up north for a little bit and all that. Were you always uh, in California before that? No, I'm originally from Portland, Oregon. That's where my family's from. Okay. And then I grew up in China for 10 years. And then I went back to Boise, Idaho, then Portland, Oregon, then California, and then Texas. What, what were you doing in China? How did that uh, happen? Yeah, my father, <laughs> he took us, there were five kids and uh, mm -hmm. he took us all to China. He started international schools over there. So like if you were mm. an American who worked for IBM or something and you had to go work in China for two years, you still wanted your children to have an American or an English education. So you'd send them to that school. That way they could come back to the U.S. after two years and still be oh, on Okay, our, that's interesting. Yeah. Did you... Uh, yeah. Did you learn any like Mandarin or any of that when you were living there? Yeah, my Mandarin's okay, but I'm a little bit angry at my parents because I wish they would have put me in Chinese school, but instead I mm. went to, you know, the international school. So Yeah, because if you tell school. someone that you, you know, either grew up there or went to school there, they would expect you to probably to be really good at it, huh? Yeah, yeah. And it's been like seven, eight years since I lived there, you know, so it's like... Yeah. Yeah. It's There's this guy I always see come up on YouTube. He's like this white dude and he's, he knows Mandarin like super well. And he'll just go to like the, you know, like Chinese restaurant. And then they're always like calling all the people over, like, check this out. Or, like this dude can yeah. speak, speak the language. Yeah. I know who you're talking about. That guy's pretty cool. I mean, it's yeah. Amazing. What was uh when you were going to like school in China, was that when you, you're in high school, right? You said? Yeah. No. So I went from like kindergarten to, sophomore so oh, my junior okay. and senior were in the u.s when did you first get into like design stuff uh <laughs> good question probably my uh sophomore or junior year of college mm. yeah i mean when i was a teenager i was trying to make like rap songs and i was trying to play soccer <laughs> yeah. that kind of thing but then i uh i went to university for a a communications degree, which I advise yeah. anyone listening, considering it, do not, do not do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I had this class called um, health communications. And one of the assignments mm -hmm. was to create a flyer. Um, okay. So I got on Illustrator and started, that was like the, my first exposure to it. Yeah. From there where you just kind of like, uh, what made you, I guess, from that point want to take it either more serious or do freelance or the YouTube and all that stuff. Yeah, it was all an accident, complete accident. Nothing. <laughs> I never bland out to anything. So after I like spent a week on this flyer learning Illustrator, mm -hmm. I, I just made a tutorial on Illustrator and uploaded it to my own channel so that I could reference it later. <laughs> How to use That's Illustrator. Hilarious. 
yeah, so that was the first video on my channel. And then I just kept making more tutorials as I learned stuff. And then eventually I just changed the content and stuff. But mm. so you were kind of teaching everything like just right after you kind of figured it out yourself. Absolutely. And I feel it's more effective because you're not so as far removed from the other beginner. A lot of people mm. are too professional. They skip steps and tutorials and, you know, it's. That's actually difficult. that. That's a good point. Sometimes uh, I've, I've been straying away from like tutorial stuff just because it's all been done and like someone's probably explained it better than me is how I kind of feel about it now. But uh, you sometimes like when you do something for so long, you forget how to like do it the most like bare bones way. Like you can't even remember how to like go all the way back to each thing because you'll just like push hotkeys or some shit and not even think about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I totally agree 100% with the idea that there's already a hundred tutorials on everything. Whether And you can go from free tutorials, there's tons of them. And then also if you go on Skillshare or somewhere else, there's paid tutorials mm -hmm. on everything. That's the exact same reason why I stopped making tutorials. Yeah. And, and I feel like, yeah. you know, for maybe selfishly or whatever, when you're making stuff, you want it to be like you want there a part of it to be like about you or like have fun. Like you've obviously done with some of your stuff. And when you're making a tutorial, like if you're messing around too much or like being yourself, sometimes like everyone's just like, what the fuck? Like, what are you doing? I just want to learn how to do this thing. And they're kind of mad at you, you know? Yeah, absolutely. But I, I do that. I, I have, I have a confession, Jesse. <laughs> Usually when I play a tutorial or I just try to learn something, I put it on two times speed and I just like skip to wherever I'm the information I'm looking for. Exactly. Time. And then, you know, as the, as the creator, you're like, why don't they want to hear about whatever I say? But we all do the same <laughs> shit. Like we skip around, like sometimes I'll waste more time skipping around to find the thing than if I just like was patient and watched it in the order okay. it was in the first few minutes or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But what, what, uh, if you started, so you started the YouTube stuff kind of almost before you got into any actual like design work for others or like client work and stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. So did so, that come from that? Um, yeah, no. So when I got to, when I graduated college, I had a degree in communication studies or whatever. Right. But then I'd also been dabbling for like a year in graphic design. So then when I moved to LA, I was like, well, do I want to try to apply to some graphic design jobs or do I want to apply to some, I don't even know what you do if you're communications major. You just work in marketing and suffer for years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I tried to apply to some marketing, uh, the graphic design jobs. And then I got one working for not a fun company. I was just editing photos. And sure. then later I got a job at, a company that designed t-shirts and that so that was like the greatest thing ever that was so fun because we were designing t-shirts for mostly little girls at macy's and tilly's and stuff like yeah. that so it was so fun but yeah to get um, those um jobs was your portfolio or whatever before that kind of just like whatever you had done on your own time basically yes yeah um i had worked in college for it like a few semesters. My brothers had this after school program. They were teaching electronics and robotics after school. So I worked mm -hmm. with them making a few flyers and stuff. So I had a few, I had a few projects that were like, you know, real printed, yeah. news, handed out to people and stuff. But a lot of it was just, you know, pretend mm -hmm. projects. That's but the, yeah, none I've, of it was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, that's a good thing though, when you think it was bad, cause that means you get better. Like, man, I, I used, when I first graduated, um, from like college, I, you know, I was, I wanted to work at like a studio and all this and like be like this cool, like design person. And I did some of those jobs to an extent, but I was looking back at some of my portfolio and shit I was applying with, with at that time. And it's like, of course I didn't get hired at the places uh -huh. that I dreamed <laughs> of. Cause like, I'm probably barely getting at about, about there right now, you know? And it's been like yeah. three or four years since then. And I think, uh, the internet and stuff has kind of discouraged people or maybe made them almost uh, overly ambitious for better or for worse that they get disappointed when they don't get like the job of their dreams right away or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've never, it's hard for me to, I, I've never had like a, I've never been disappointed before. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is I've always been disappointed, but I just have a personality that's like, 
I just keep, if one thing doesn't work out, I try something else. So you keep yeah. Moving, but. Just keep it moving. That's good. That's a way yeah. better mindset to have than, uh, you know, riddled with anxiety and just moving around <laughs> worried about everything. Yeah. I think it's just because I'm not, I'm not like, this might sound bad, but I'm not worried about my life at all. <laughs> mm. Like I don't, I don't really care how I'm perceived. I don't care what I, I mean, I, I obviously want to achieve a lot, but I don't, nothing worries me because I don't care about my life too much. <laughs> right. That sounds depressing, but it's my tool to be like, yeah. oh, I actually need to think this way in order to keep moving and do the things I want to do. Yeah, it's like optimistic nihilism, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> that I think I knowing, hearing you say that, it kind of makes sense because um, I was looking back at your channel because I didn't even find your channel until probably way after the point where it was like everyone was watching it at one point, you know, uh, like in its prime or whatever. Like I've, I've more yeah. got into it with the house shit, to be honest, like when I oh, first really, saw yeah. that. Um, but I watched like I watched some of the older stuff and it makes sense that you think that way because it seems like you were never afraid to kind of like switch it up. Like you could tell there's different like eras throughout it. And like at one point you're doing this then you're doing a lot of the redesigns then you're doing like the contests like you were always able to kind of reinvent it because I feel like you were like you were saying you didn't really care if people didn't like it or not. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if I say 100% honestly, of course I want people to like it, but at the mm -hmm. end of the day, I, I try to, I honestly try to see things in terms of life and death. So if mm -hmm. this isn't gonna kill me, just do it. Yeah. <laughs> and then it ends up making your life better, which is the funny part, you know? Right. When did you yeah. first, uh, when did you say you would, you felt that it was like your channel started kind of blowing up and you noticed there was actually like a big viewership on each video you put up? Yeah, absolutely. When you're talking about redesigns. Okay. I have a claim to fame. I, <laughs> not, not really. So when I started on YouTube doing actual design work, mm -hmm. I want somebody to fact check me on this, but no other channels were actually doing design. So they were doing tutorials or they were doing critiquing. So they wouldn't actually right. like, change a design or anything. So like, so I, I took inspiration from, you know, the future Will Patterson and stuff. They would look at portfolios and then they would just critique it and just talk about it. And yeah, yeah I'm like, well, this is a visual thing. Why don't we do some visual learning here? So I'll take your design and actually make the changes that I'm talking about. And then, mm. um, yeah, so apparently from then, that's when my channel like, started to get more popular from that. Yeah. The, and because the one component is I'm actually designing something. And the second component is of the user interaction, you know, I'm working right. on their logos. And, and then they're third, getting like a free upgrade to their shit. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if any of them ever took it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. But the third was the polls, dude. I used to put polls in my YouTube videos, but did I make it better? Did I make it worse? A lot of people said mm -hmm. that was engaging too, because I got to say it was bad. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. People, even if it's like a negative thing, they want to interact with it, you know, and feel yeah, absolutely. involved. Yeah, yeah I, I think, I don't know, yeah, like fact checking or whatever either, but I would say you were probably one of the only people, like you and the only other person I know that uh, has us, you know, as maybe similar or whatever uh, audience as you on YouTube was like, is Kel Lauren and they do kind of, you know, similar stuff but um not as much redesigning you know their own process or whatever but yeah you and you and them were definitely a big inspiration for me to maybe not like content wise but just i saw like oh shit you can actually just do that all the other people were doing stuff a lot more um i don't know like it felt like you said too removed like too professional maybe like yeah. it felt like you can't resonate with it because it's like some guy that's like charge 50 grand for a logo or whatever. And it, that's like not Are we realistic. talking about the same guy? Cause I feel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, number one, I could never try. I, I don't have the, I don't know if it's confidence or what to charge $50,000. But if you literally don't have a team of like 10 people, there's zero reason you should be charging $50,000 for a logo. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's my thought process. But if you have a whole design agency, then yeah, you have to, charge pay everyone and so, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah like so i guess um 
that was thank you for that you know showing that that was like that you're i'm sure there's a lot of people that saw the shit you're doing and were like oh damn you can actually just put whatever you want on youtube about design shit <laughs> yeah dude yeah you're welcome i'll be expecting some royalties whenever <laughs> Yeah, once I start getting some money, man, maybe I'll have to, I'll, I'll, I'll come help you fix like some, uh, some blinds or something. Yes, please. Yes. I'll take, I'll take three hours of work, please. What, uh, do you think then like, that's probably why I was working so well. Cause it was almost like a, like untapped kind of demographic. Like there was no one else to really watch in that kind of field. Well, I think the demographic was slightly the same. Mm -hmm. but it brought it brought more people who yeah i mean it definitely brought people who weren't ever interested in logo design before yeah because somebody can be interested in some random person redesigning somebody other randoms uh, some other random person's logo but yeah. someone will not really be interested in a random person critiquing somebody else's mm. logo because there's there's no there's no before and after there's no action there's yeah. right i think you, you probably were able to you know, capture more of like the casual person that doesn't really even know what you're maybe doing exactly design wise, but they're like, this is kind of cool and he's funny. So whatever. Yeah. Cause everybody has thoughts on any logo. So if there's a, like a huge company, like if Nike changed their logo tomorrow, everybody like, I hate that design or not, you know, whether yeah. they care about logos at all. Right. Yeah. That, yeah. that makes sense. Cause that's sometimes something I've kind of struggled with is I want you know, first and foremost, when I make things, uh, unless it's for a client or just like a thing for fun, if it's something f catered somewhat towards designers, like they're the people I want to enjoy this first and foremost, because it's kind of about this niche, but I don't want it to be so like inside baseball, you know, that like a normal person is yeah. just like, what the fuck is he even like doing, you know, or like, what's he even talking about? I want someone to be able to be like, this is kind of cool or whatever. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was easier for me too because I've never been in like a graphic design community. I never had mm. any uh, classmates who were graphic designers. I never had any friends who were graphic designers, anything like that. I was, I never ha was like deep into it in any of the lingo, anything like that. So it was, it was easy for me to be like, I just make whatever I want about design. Cause yeah. I didn't, you know, yeah. On the other side of that, when it started kind of blowing up, was there any part of you that kind of felt like imposter syndrome or anything like that? Um, no. That's good. Because. <laughs> I probably would have. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing that gets to me or got to me some was just, you know, some of the hate comments. You're like, you know. I don't know what I, I want to repeat here. I won't repeat any of the bad stuff, but some of yeah. it was pretty pretty painful or hurtful, but um, that was probably the most negative emotion, but it was also the best opportunity for growth because there's some creators out there who will like block somebody or, or like delete the comment. I never do that. I always, if it's not that bad, I will reply like, hey, hope your day gets better. I'm sorry I ruined it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's like a mechanism to be like, you know what? Even if they say this bad stuff, that's an opportunity for me to be like, hey, it's not that serious. And I'm a nice person. I'm sure you are too. Yeah. Right. But so it, when it comes to imposter syndrome, for me, I guess the question is, are there real designers who deserve to have people watching them design? Is that kind of the question? So I'm not really a real designer, so but people mm. are watching the design. Is that that might be the crux of where I would feel the imposter syndrome? I see. Yeah, that I think there's so much levels to that too. Like I feel that way when uh, in a different kind of realm where there's these designers online that I really look up to and like they work on like some insane stuff, and now. I have like more like followers or anything like that on than them on like Instagram or something. And then it uh. makes me think like, well, this is all bullshit then. Cause they're way better than me, you know? So like, <laughs> yeah. why is, uh, yeah. it, it's weird. Like that stuff can be, that's why like when you people like are sad that maybe they don't have that, I'm like, oh, trust me. Like this shit's irrelevant. Like it's like those super rich people that are like, you don't need money. I know it sounds maybe yeah. like that, but <laughs> it's kind of true. Like, it's like, it really doesn't matter as long as you're having fun and yeah. kind of doing shit you like at the end of the day. And 
And here's something I haven't heard vocalized before, but I want people to remember this. If your goal is to become a better designer or better at your craft, do not post all the time. Do not edit YouTube videos. Do not shoot YouTube videos. Don't don't shoot as TikToks. All like, let me see how many hours a week you'll do spend doing that. Obviously, mm-hmm. that just by nature of time, it's going to take so much actual skill. You could be improving. So I most I think most people get it, but the people who are most public with their projects are usually are nowhere. I mean, a lot of some of them are. I don't want to be negative. <laughs> no, I know, I know what usually, you're getting at though. Okay, are not as good as the people who are just like quietly. They upload maybe a photo. Sometimes they keep their dribble updated, and they're working with massive clients, massive companies. Right. They're on the inside of all of these projects, but they do not have large followings. And one of the reasons for that is they just spend the time on their craft, or they spend the time getting the relationships with the people at the companies they need to have. Mm-hmm. 100%. I feel like it's a weird, um, like a double edged sword kind of because, like, you want to do that other stuff. And especially when, like, doing the content or whatever you want to call it, it's fun, you know? And, like, I have noticed, though, that, yeah, like, there's times where on a, before I did any of this, on a day where I kind of had nothing to do, I'd probably just um, work on some more personal projects or, you know, do some design work. But then there's other times now where that same block of time, I'll fill it with like, oh, I'll just get ahead on this next like edit or whatever. Cause uh-huh. you're like, yeah. so yeah, I think you're right. There's, um, there's, I guess you kind of have to decide at some point, like what's the mm-hmm. most important thing to you. If you really want to just be like the best designer in the world, then you're probably not going to be able to, you know, have a big social media following or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Like if you look at most of the creative directors for large creative companies, none of them have large social followings. Yeah, and, and it's just pictures the of their family and shit. On <laughs> absolutely. <there. laughs> and, and some door they liked, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Like some street sign in Italy. <laughs> yeah, dude, for yeah. real. It's, it looks yeah. like just like you wouldn't be able to tell a difference from like that and like your uncle or some shit. Absolutely. No, 100%. Yeah, so... Yeah. Yeah, but I noticed that when I was applying to jobs and I was trying to find the people who were like the heads of the companies are working there. I'd be like, uh-huh. what do they do? And I'm like, I have no idea still because it's yeah. just spaghetti on their page or some <laughs> shit. <laughs> but it will be interesting to see in the future because we could make the argument that those people don't have large social followings because they're a bit older. Like, let's say, you know, ah, that's true. By now. But we could see in 30 years from now if like creative directors for, I don't know, fashion companies or anything like that. Right. I would assume they will have larger volumes. Maybe. That's a good point because there are some like uh, outliers to what we're saying. Because I know some people mm-hmm. where they are still doing that and then they work at such a with such a big team that they can have someone else do all that for them, but still oh, yeah. kind of uphold their, like post their work for them, you know, or post behind the scenes or whatever. And that's kind of like yeah. the ideal situation. Maybe you still get to kind of live in both areas or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, you can still spend time on your craft and then also. Yeah. Everything. yeah. What, uh, when was the point when, like, so when you, the design videos and then the house, how big was there's like a gap in between there, right? That you didn't yeah. post anything? Uh huh. How long yeah. was that? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, there was probably like six months before I posted the first house video and then I posted like three or four house videos and then there was a seven month gap between that and the ne- next one. Yeah. So, yeah. There was some gaps. What was the, <laughs> when you first did the, I guess in between the last design video and the first house video, um, yeah. was there a lot of, like, were people commenting a lot? Like, what happened? Like, where'd you go? Yeah. And stuff? Yeah, it started to get that way. Yeah. I was in a really bad position. <laughs> mm. <laughs> like, uh, I rented this studio in LA to try to have, like, group gatherings of graphic designers. And yeah. uh, so then in order to make the rent on the studio, I moved out of my apartment and I actually bought a van and I renovated the van. I was going to stay in the van and then work in the studio. My van got stolen. It got trashed. So now I'm stuck living in the studio. Oh, there was damn. no bathroom. I couldn't shower. There was no hot water. So <laughs> and then and then COVID hit and they shut down the whole like group gathering thing. So now I'm stuck in this studio with nowhere to shower. And the thing I want to do, I can't do. So uh, <laughs> I just went back, uh, back home to Portland and stayed with my parents for a few months. And that's when I worked with my brothers flipping houses. So we did like three or four mm. houses. 
And then uh, I took the money from that to buy this house in Texas. So I drove down here. Okay. Is that the same brothers that you were doing the flyers for when you're in? Yeah. So the same thing happened to them. They, so they were in like, you know, 30 elementary schools in Portland doing after school yeah. programs. And then, you know, COVID just shut it all down. So then their business is like, so then they started house flipping. When you did that, when you we were just working with them on like the renovations and stuff, pretty much. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. And then you just got like, you really liked it or what? To, to no, change your I whole. Enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> you obviously I mean, I the... <laughs> changed your whole kind of, you know, life plan almost centered around yeah. like doing this for the past year at least. Yeah. Well, it was kind of a, because I did, at that point, I didn't have anywhere to live, right? I was just like in in the room in my parents house so yeah. i was more of a necessity i was you know the hierarchy of needs i was at the bottom just more like oh i'm not thinking about my career or anything like that i'm thinking okay i need to get out of my parents house what can i do uh you know and i was like i don't really want to pay rent again so if i can buy a house for as cheap as i can renovate it and then i'll then now now i'm at the finally the point where i can decide what i want to do now. yeah so was it hard to do the actual like recording during that big period you stopped again? Was it because you were just trying to get the shit done pretty much? Um, slightly. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Cause it obviously <laughs> slows you down when you're setting up fucking tripods and shit and like trying to go yeah. record time lapses and everything. <laughs> yeah. It's not that bad, but yeah, it's pretty bad. But mainly I was in a relationship with someone and that was a very um dramatic toxic relationship it wasn't mm. um supportive she so. wanted the design videos back huh? or they wanted the whoever <laughs> wanted the design videos back <laughs> no nah, she was uh, uh no nah, it was worse it was much worse <laughs> but yeah 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 so i mean I, I won't blame anybody of course you're you're in charge of your own life but right. it was just like i couldn't focus on the house and i couldn't focus on making any videos because something else was destroy right. my confidence make me feel horrible you know and it was just taking so much time and effort and energy to address this other thing yeah i mean dude from the getting the co-working space to like now like it's like so much shit it seems like just from this small uh kind of insight you're giving me it's a lot of uh not a lot of like um constant variables you know everything is just changing and changing and changing it's really hard to stay on any kind of work schedule when your life's very different like every few months or whatever thank you for saying that that's very empathetic and yes mm. I, <laughs> thank you yeah yeah i mean but so finally now i'm at the point where you know i'm just like i feel quite a big sense of relief and that's one right. of the reasons why i've been making more videos lately and just having more fun with it because i'm like okay now i have a actual place to live i got an actual bathroom and yeah i'm about to have two roommates so i can have some income and yeah dope for a while were you mostly working in the like van when parts of the house were torn apart yeah i was living in it yeah Anybody considering van life, I have one <laughs> one thing you should just consider. Get a van that you're tall enough to stand up in. If you, if you have uh, a van that you're not, <laughs> that was the hardest part. But it wasn't that. It wasn't bad. It was fine because, you know, the weather's, it was during summer. The weather wasn't, you know, freezing or yeah, all the time. It's hot though. Yeah. Over there at least. Yeah. When, uh. I remember watching the first video and thinking like uh, being overwhelmed by it. Like, Jesus Christ, like, how is he going to even fix this house? Like, because as a viewer, I have no uh, knowledge on like how much you know about doing this. So for me, I'm like, oh, he's fucked. You know, like, this looks crazy. Yeah. Like, I don't know if he's going <laughs> to even figure it out or whatever. But how obviously from that the contrast from that to like the bathroom i'm like oh damn like that looks nice like if i saw that hey. on a craigslist ad i'd be like all over yeah. that so <laughs> how has your kind of maybe like thought process or mindset changed throughout the different phases of of like the you know it's been like a year right uh, roughly yeah. the entire process mm -hmm. yeah so my thought process in terms of like whether I felt discouraged at some points and got back yeah. or in terms of like, okay, yeah. I never get discouraged by the project that I'm working on. 
Mm. And I, I'm always able to visualize things. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's one of the skills, I guess. I don't know if that'd be an interesting question. If, if designers have to have the ability to visualize stuff before they start working on it. But anyways, I, I would say I have a, uh, a strong sense of being able to visualize something before I've done it. So if I ever felt discouraged, I was always like, oh no, but it's gonna look like this. And that's the, mm-hmm. the key that I use to keep myself going. Because yeah, it was like, ev- like obviously every day, if you're waking up in the same clothes you've worn for a month, you take another cold shower, you have no bathroom. <laughs> you're yeah. like this could easily be discouraging <laughs> but no i can see it so you just gotta keep going yeah i i mean that's good because even when you let's say it doesn't turn out exactly like as like the render in your mind or whatever are you still yeah. kind of just like whatever this is the best i could have done it it never turns out like the, the right thing in your mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but I think you'd agree that that's where kind of, a lot of times that's where the magic happens. That's where it's, mm. sometimes it turns out better and sometimes it turns out worse, but that's just the nature of finishing any project, you know? And then there's constraints like money. Obviously a lot of this house, I would, I visualize differently, wish it would be different. But when mm-hmm. you add constraints as time and money, constraints can either do two things, make it way more creative and awesome, or it can make it not as cool. It a lot of everything is just random. I think right project. Yeah. Were you uh, you talking about constraints? Like with the money, is that why you got the job at the Home Depot to kind of help fund, fund some personal expenses or it, whatever? It, <laughs> I had zero source of income. You know, I didn't make a video for seven months. I, you know, so yeah. And then, and then, and then, especially at that time, like my projections for how much it would cost were off because like wood skyrocketed, you know, all this stuff. So it was like, oh, really? expensive. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like, and then you did, uh, you said that you did like a few design projects, right? Over the past uh, year. Yeah. I did, uh, not many, maybe like two or three. And that I saw you kind of addressing, you know, what, like what you think about that whole thing now, you know, and like, uh, I was wondering if you can maybe elaborate a little bit more on how you feel about the future of you as being a designer or not. Oh yeah. So I always look at my life in terms of skills I want to acquire for the future. So if you want to be a really good freelancer, a lot of people will say, well, yeah, you have trouble with clients, but the way to deal with that is just get a better process, more experience and just get a smoother process. Mm Mm-hmm. So you have a choice. You can spend your future time and attention creating a better process to make it easier to work with clients, or you can spend your future time and attention doing something else, which is what I would like to do. So whenever I design, I'm always, whenever I design for a client, I'm always super, super invested in the end product, way Mm -hmm. more than I should be, which is another painful thing for me. (laughs) Because whenever I'm working on a client, I always want to ask, how are you starting this? Do you have investors? Uh, yeah. What kind of customers are you trying to reach? I always want to. I always want to like follow the progression after. And the unfortunate part is a lot of the projects don't get started. A lot of the right. projects, you know, I never hear from again or anything like that. So it's painful for two mm-hmm. reasons. I I'm highly invested in the business part of it because I, right. I love that. I love how this design will live in life. So. To answer your question moving forward, I would like to keep doing design, but f- on projects where I also have control of the end project, a product or project. So what I mean mm. by that is I would like to start producing projects, whether that's a video game, whether that's an animation, anything like that. And on my channel, I would like to show the process of design. Okay, but then what happens after the design? How do we market right. this game? How do we work with other designers? How do we follow the whole life cycle of this project? Because that's really what I'm I'm super interested in. Yeah, that's cool. And I've dealt with that too, man. Like working on, especially yeah, like branding stuff and logo design. Like, it, you know, I have more power to these people starting these companies, but it seems like they don't really know what they're doing. And that you, you give them the design work and it's all good and it checks the boxes and it, it feels like the needs for their target audience and whatnot. But then for me, it's probably like seven or eight times out of 10, they, they don't become a real life company. It all gets killed in like conceptualization. And it's like, 
people tell me things like, oh, that aren't in design, like, oh, well, you got paid still, right? And I'm like, well, of course, but like, uh, it wasn't that's not fun. all of it. Like, it's, it's, you want to yeah. be out at the store and be like, look, remember when we worked on that? That shit's <laughs> yeah. real now. But instead, it's just in a PDF yeah. somewhere, you know, on some yeah. old ass MacBook or some shit. Yeah. One thing I've, re- I've recognized is there's two, there's two ways to tell whether this company will. So I, I did work at a, I worked at a, also a design studio for a little bit. We did just packaging design for um, like makeup and beauty products. Mm-hmm. So in order to work with that agency, these companies had to pay sixty, hundred thousand dollars or something. So that way, I always knew, yeah, these projects that I'm working on, they will be a real thing in real life. Right. So a lot of people, if you're working in a large design studio, you can go out in the world and see stuff you're working on because of the high budgets. It kind of demands that. Mm-hmm. When you're working with just startups or people, individuals starting a business, one of the ways to tell whether it's going to happen or not is if they come to you for their branding or logo before they have a product. It's going to be very difficult to start the product because anyone who's actually starting a product logo and branding is like step number 25 in starting a business. Yeah. So that's, so if you're a graphic designer out there and you want to have your stuff like actually created and out there, work with clients who already have like a prototype who are maybe even already have a customer base of like their friends and family and people who are using this. And then you know that, okay, they've done it right and they're at step 20 and Mm -hmm. they're looking for a logo now. Yeah, and even the thing you talked about with the budget makes sense. Like as I grow as a designer and get bigger projects, the ones that are where I'm charging more and they're paying more, there's already a more of an investment from both people. So, you know, back when I was only charging like a few hundred bucks for a logo or whatever, it was kind of like if they didn't use it, they're not going to, it's not the end of the world. But once projects get bigger and you're doing like full brandings for thousands of dollars or whatever, it's a lot more of a hit for them just to like give up or whatever and not keep the kind of process moving. So I think that's, uh, you almost uh, grow with like the client base that you have as you get better Mm -hmm. at something like you get, there's more of a mutual respect, I guess, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. And I think that's a great component you said is that the money they invest is also, I mean, I guess it depends how rich they are, but yeah. If yeah, you, that's if true. You have some of those people that just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Basically what you're saying is you want to work on stuff outside of just design, but the projects that you're working on, you want to be the designer involved in them, kind of. Yeah, well, I would like to, My my plan going forward is, like okay, let's say, ah, uh, my problem is I have I have I have I have ideas for everything. <laughs> so, yeah. So like, because <laughs> I would say I'm not I'm not like a graphic designer. I guess I'm a visual thinker and and I just like to build anything. Mm-hmm. So when I look at it that way, like let's say I have a design uh, an idea for a video game. My goal I hope would be find two or three game developers find some 3d artists and then maybe Mm -hmm. i can help work i'll like hopefully manage the group effort and then also work on maybe there's some ui designs for the menus maybe there's uh and then also when you're launching it on steam trying to build stuff uh build up the wish list and things like that so i would i would really like to tackle two things mostly the business of starting creative projects with Mm -hmm. design thrown in Okay. Do you, do you think that, cause when I watched your video where you were saying like, basically like fuck clients or whatever, you know, like I kind of <laughs> just want to, uh, do like design without that like component. Do you think uh-huh. that you maybe always kind of felt that way? And then this, you were just kind of in this routine as like a designer and this big break and like house project gave you kind of like clarity on that and made you realize that maybe you weren't as into it as you thought you were? Yeah, but um, yes, I would say it brought some clarity, but also I think I was pretty well aware. There was a time where, there was a time where I was making like three or four or five YouTube videos a week. Mm-hmm. And I also, ha- I was also doing projects, maybe like 10, 20 in a month. Mm-hmm. And they were like only $300. 
That's right. just ridiculous, right? I, you can't yeah. you can't maintain all that. And it turned out that these projects for clients and designers were just way way more may way more work, way less fun than just making a YouTube video. So that's kind of the the most clear moment. I was like, dude, right. there's, there's no yeah. There's I no mean, especially reason. at that price point, like you could make yeah. a video and make more off the AdSense at the views you were getting and shit. So it's like, yeah, I, don't know. I mean. Yeah. It seems, uh, yeah. I, I, I feel you. What we, it's like we were saying where if you're doing this stuff, you're going to have to give up a little bit of the like craft or whatever. So what I do to minimize that, cause I still want to be like the best designer that I can be is that I take on like one or two projects a month, but they're just bigger and they pay more rather than trying to like start and stop a bunch of stuff. I could see how you could get burnt out trying to track down all those emails and all that shit. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's basically the only way to do it is to only do like two projects a month and try to charge, mm-hmm. you know, a lot more. Yeah. Do you, but, then, uh, but then go ahead. Yeah, I mean, but then you just run in the I mean, it's not a problem. You just got then your question becomes, you know, how do you find the right people who are willing to pay, you know, a couple thousand dollars twice right. and, and then keep that consistent, find two or three of them every single month. Right. Yeah, there's always something, you know, but we, we try to we try to figure it out it's yeah. so like this isn't really a question i guess but it's it's funny seeing because we all like um change throughout the years but it's so funny like looking back i was looking back at your channel just to kind of get in some little more insight onto uh-huh. the zimri of now and 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 old and from you know four or five years ago to now like the change in your what you're doing and like how you look and demeanor and everything like you still have that (laughs) same uh, laugh and like kind of sensibility but man like you went it's like a anamorph thing of you turning more like blue collar (laughs) you know into like a worker guy like now you're with the cargo shorts and the safety goggles and before Uh you had like the wired glasses and the (laughs) button-up shirt and shit yeah and all, and also like physically, I feel like I, I look like back then I was biking 12 miles every day, six oh, miles, damn. Week, six miles back. And then I was playing soccer four or five times a week. I was like skinniest I've ever been in my life. And then, <laughs> so that's one component that changed too. But dude, I literally took a photo of myself at work like a month ago. And I thought I looked just like you <laughs> in this photo. Not right now. <laughs> oh no, no. Okay. But yeah. <sighs> yeah. yeah, I changed. Uh, a lot. You don't have the photo or what? I thought no, I can show you. I don't know. <laughs> but I don't know. You'd be like, no, nah, it doesn't look like me. <laughs> I don't care. If it takes too long, too, I'll cut it out. <laughs> no, no, it's right. It's, it's right here. Okay, so I'm just wearing a hat. And <laughs> yeah, like, there you go. <laughs> that's Jesse. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's all you need is the glasses and the hat. <laughs> Honestly, it's yeah. funny because half the time I'm not even wearing hats when I. Uh, like go out but it's just that whenever yeah. i have to record i'm like fuck i don't want to i didn't take a shower so i'm just gonna put a hat on or whatever uh, like, okay it's more yeah. out of uh out of maybe laziness or or embarrass, embarrassment or whatever but no um, that's out of commitment to your craft you're like mm, yeah. i don't always have time for shower because there's gonna... sometimes man like i'm sure you felt this way with the building like I need to what I need to start doing the thing I need to do that day as soon as I can after waking up or the farther yeah. I get into not doing it, the less likely it's going to get done. So I try yeah, to do the most important thing first. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I think there's two, two schools of thoughts. Well, everybody agrees that you should start doing stuff early in the day, but then there's two schools of thought, whether you start with the most difficult thing or you start mm. with like the easiest to build some momentum and get started. That's but a good yeah, point I, too. Everybody's different. Get everybody's some little different. wins in to give you uh, yeah. some confidence. <laughs> yeah. But I think on the flip side, it should be your little wins are, okay, I got out of bed. Okay. I, ate some yeah. food. I took a shower. Those are the, those are the wins. And then right. you can start on your, uh, what, what do you, uh, what's your, I know it obviously changes with the different kind of steps or phases you are in this kind of house thing, but have you set mm-hmm. some kind of, like routine or like schedule for yourself around like building stuff or fixing things? Yeah, now I have. Before, because I worked part-time at Home Depot and all the hours were completely different. It was very difficult. But I quit like two and a half weeks ago. So now, yeah, now it's like, it's pretty good, especially because, especially because there's like other people in the house now. So Mm -hmm. it's a big motivator. 
And, but yeah, my schedule is usually like nine in the morning to nine at night. I work on the house. And then if I have a video to edit, it's like nine at night to one or two. Damn, 12 hours you're putting in on the house. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. I just, I have no family. You know, it's like, right. I, have, I have nothing, you know, why not? For, for me, for me, you. for me, it's why not? For other people, they have a lot more things they have to do, you know? I get that way sometimes working on projects or it happens a lot more with my own projects like YouTube and personal design stuff than client work. Like you, it's easier yeah. to get invested in that and work all day on stuff that's uh, directly like rewarding yourself. But okay, I get yeah. into that sometimes and then I'll have some friends like too, like you got to chill or like you just worked like all day and it's like you think you almost think like you're not supposed to do that, but you but then you look back at that day and you're like, that was like cool though. You know, like I liked doing that, you know? So why would I stop if I was having a good time kind of? Yeah, no, it's, it's, let me ask your views on burnout. But my brother has this idea that you only feel burnout if the projects you're working on are not progressing in the way that you'd imagined. So even if you're physically tired, you still feel really excited and mentally energized because you see that the work you're putting in is still progressing. It's when the stuff starts to flatline that that's yeah. when you really feel the burnout. So for me, I can spend as many hours, like as many weeks in a row, and I won't mm -hmm. be burnt out unless there's a stall or things start get, you know getting worse. Yeah, I think I I think I'm I'm right there too. I've noticed when I worked at a company, you know, you wouldn't catch me doing like the extra work after five okay, o'clock yeah. or whatever. Like some of the people that were, you know, hitting you up on Slack at like ten. Like back when oh, I worked yeah. at a, a office, I was like, "Fuck you," you know, I'm not gonna uh -huh. do this stuff. Like it's my time off. But now that I'm a freelancer and like do this other YouTube and whatever, since it's like all going to the greater big thing, like my uh -huh my uh, brand or whatever is like the house that you're kind of yeah. doing in a, in a yeah. sense. So like each little thing, you see it compound and actually benefit. So yeah, mm -hmm. like since there's no, since there's like, you want to do it, it's you don't get burnt out. Cause you're like, uh, I don't know, like it's rewarding, I guess more uh -huh. is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Considering how different your life was from five years ago to now, what do you, kind of want for yourself in these next five years and what do you think that'll be um so i've never had friends <laughs> and i've and i've never been financially stable and i've never mm. been location stable because even though i lived in la for four years i lived in four different apartments okay and so and, you know, I've moved over 30 times in my life, whether that's different country, different state, different city, or just different apartment. So, <laughs> and I've never been good at business, financially speaking. So in the next five years, I would like to have some sort of stability, some mm -hmm. friends, and mm -hmm. some financial stability, I guess you could you could name it that. Um, okay. So, I, I mean, I have I have clear, like, business goals as well if you are looking more for that but this is more yeah, no that's that's like fair well man yeah. uh i think we're friends now so you got at, at the very least you have me as a friend so if i ever Thank go you, to texas <laughs> uh, yes, I'll, I'll hit you up and then uh i wish you the best with money and finishing the house and everything and i'm excited to see the progression and i'm 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 and like other people waiting for the the big house reveal. So Oh really? That, okay. That's coming <laughs> thank out. Thank you, man. No, yeah. thank you, Jesse, for inviting me on here. I think it's amazing what you're doing. Everything seems so professional too. You got all the scheduling <laughs> figured out, you got all the audio, and then I know you're doing this podcast among all your client work and everything mm -hmm. you're doing on Instagram as well. And it's like yeah, it's very impressive. So Keep thank going. you, man. I appreciate it. And thank you everyone for watching. And you can check out Zimri on YouTube, Instagram, all that stuff. And we'll see you next time. Peace out, everybody. Oh, thank you, bro. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>